this is Dr. Stokes. This is Wednesday night Bible study. Wednesday night Bible study. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, this is the first Bible study of the new year. Um, when you start your day off with the word, when you start your year off with the word, when you just start off with the word, when you start off with the word, you're starting off with a great foundation. Start with the word. Uh, Deacon Marshall would always say, stick with the word. He would say, stick with the word. So let us start with the word and let us stick with the word. So this is Bible study for the night. Um, I've written the um, scriptures down for us. We're in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6 today. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 19. So let us gather in prayer eternal god we come before you this day to say thank you for your word oh god thank you for the witness of your word oh god and not just this world but the witness of your word in our lives oh god father as we go deeper into your word father not just on today but this year father and even for the remainder of our lives oh lord Lord, we pray that we would anchor ourselves in your word, O oh God, that we would ground ourselves in your word, O oh God, that you would strengthen us by your word, O oh God, wash us in your word, O oh God. Father, may we be like that tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in due season, and whatsoever we shall do shall prosper. Father, let the word be that meaningful and powerful to us, O oh God, that we consult it before we consult anything else, O oh God. Father, for heaven and earth will pass away before one drop or tittle of your word. So as we go forth into this Bible study this day, O oh God, we want to keep your word in our hearts and in our minds, O oh Lord, so that we might use it, apply wisdom unto it, Father, as we live meaningful lives in you and through you as your disciples in 2022. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our Bible study today is going to start, is going to be in the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 is going to be Bible study tonight. Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start off with verse number 19. And it's a simple thing. It's an old perspective for a new year. It's an old perspective for a new year. And as we go deeper in God's word today, we definitely want to keep the old perspective of keeping God first, the old perspective of letting his word be our guide, the old perspective of praying and fasting. We want to keep that in our mind, even in this new year. Uh, we're, you know, we sing the song Old Acquaintance, but it's an old acquaintance, but it's a new year. It's a new year, but we still have that same old acquaintance. So, Pastor Tim actually preached that sermon, y'all. New Year's. Don't ask me what year, but I remember he preached it. No the acquaintance for a new year. So, Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 19. I want to read all the way to verse 34 till the chapter ends. And then um, exp uh, do an expository um, study upon each verse, moving verse by verse. So, let's read. Um, again, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And hear what the words of Christ say. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you, may, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, 
Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, or for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. So, Jesus is doing something uh, specific in this, in this entire pericope. So, Matthew is set up in such a way. Matthew's entire gospel is supposed to let you know that Jesus is, a, is the Jewish Messiah come to save the Jewish, come to save the Jewish nations um, of their sins. They deny him. We know that that is true. Um, but that's Matthew's entire perspective, that Jesus was a Jew and he came to save the Jewish nation, although the Jewish nation denies him. Chapter 1, we encounter the birth of Jesus. Chapter 2, we encounter Jesus leaving Israel, uh, leaving Bethlehem, going to Egypt. Chapter 3, Jesus comes back grown and he gets baptized of John. Chapter 4, Jesus' ministry commences. He goes out. He is tempted of the adversary. Chapter 6, he, uh, that's chapter 5, chapter 5, cha that's chapter 4, chapter 5, he begins his ministry, he begins the preaching ministry of his life. The, that's where you get the Mount of, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which this is actually a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And chapter 6, uh, we encounter Jesus giving practical ministerial advice to people. And that's where we are. He gives us the the model prayer, which is what we call the Lord's Prayer. The model prayer, um, he gives us these practical advices about living as men and women in our faith. So, in verse number 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Where moth break, where... Treasures where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal. So, first thing Jesus is talking about in this verse is people are concerned with their finances. They're concerned with their finances. In this new year, I want you all to I want you all to have a mindset that finances is not going to be the end all be all for you. While money answers all things, that is found in Ecclesiastes, I want to say chapter. 10 money answers all things. I want to say it's chapter 10. Ricky, Ricky Oliver would, would, would castigate me if I didn't know this scripture because he showed taught that money answers all things. I want to say it's um, Ecclesiastes 10, 10. I'm looking it up real time. Um, yep, Ecclesiastes 10 19 also. So uh, while money answers all things, money is not the answer to all things. Money answers all things is a response to a worldly system, very capitalistic perspective. Money answers all things is a mindset that it, unless you have money, you cannot acquire things. But I want you to know that money is a resource and God is the source. Please hear me when I tell you money is a resource. God is the source. And so often we confuse the source with the resource. No, the source is where the resource comes from, i.e., the prefix re, which means it has to flow from something, flows from the source. So Jesus talks about this, and he talks about this in the, in the perspective of finance. He says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. So often we believe that these earthly systems are, excuse me, these earthly systems are going to sustain us. These earthly systems are going to keep us. But if you do not know any aspect of history, most of the people who are on this 
uh, Facebook Live today was alive in October of 2008. You might not have been here in October of 1929, but you, most of the people on here were here, were living in America in October of 2008. I remember being at Fisk University, and I remember walking down the stairs, and I remember there was this big hoopla about Washington Mutual had failed. Washington Mutual was a bank. It was a wild move, is what they call it. Washington Mutual had failed. Wachovia had failed. Good big bank in the South. These banks were failing left and right. And then General Motors needed a bailout. And then Chrysler needed a bailout. They had brought into a system, they had brought into a world system that money was the answer. If you can't remember any other time in you can I pray that you remember that when all of these financial institutions failed. They failed the housing market housing market burst. Um Fortune 500 companies failed. Merrill Lynch uh failed all of these big houses, these big financial institutes, they fail. Jesus is saying in verse 19, don't worry about your finance. He said, lay up not for yourselves treasures on earth, where neither Ross, where, where, moth, where, where, where <laughs> moth and rust consume and thieves break through and steal. He's telling you that finances are temporary. Our finances are temporary. And investing in a system in this world where you are totally reliant upon the resources of this world is going to always fail you. That's why our hope is always in Jesus. Our hope, that's why Paul tells uh, the church, um, he says in the book of Acts, he said, in him, in him who is him, Christ, in Christ, the son of the living God, in Christ, in him, we live, move, and have our being. In 2022, Please do not let finances, do not let finances be the stress and the trouble of you. Why not? Because you know the one who owns not just the cattle upon a thousand hills, you know the one who owns the hills. So don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. And I want you to, he, he sets it up when he says where, where, where rust consumes and moth and, and moth and rust consume and thieves break through and still he sets it up to remind us that these things are temporary the earthen uh these, these these earthen institutions that we are investing in these earthly institutions that that we are leaning on they're temporary he makes it clear that those things are going to fail those things are going to fail but listen to what he gives the caveat to. he says don't invest in that he says but Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither raw moth nor rust destroys nor thieves break through and steal. While the earthen institution is where it's temporary and is going to fail and is going to pass away, it's going to tarnish, there is an institution that you can invest in where your investment is always going to be secure, a secure investment. A secure investment is an investment where you know you're going to get back your return. If you, if anybody here has invested in anything, you know when you invest something, your expectation is that you get back a return. So Jesus is telling these people, he says, he says to them, do not worry about these things in this world don't invest in these things in this world. In this new year, I want everybody on this Facebook Live to be intentional on investing in the things of God. Be intentional in your life on investing in the things of God. Every year, for at least the last eight, nine years, I have been reading through my Bible every year. And I have grown from reading that word, from from meditating on that word, from studying that word. And I want you to have a clear understanding that reading the word is different than meditating on the word. It's different than studying the word. Reading the word is a good first step. Reading the word, some of us have to, have to overcome a lot of things 
because we feel like our read comprehension, we don't understand the word. We, we feel like we don't really understand. We don't understand what the word is saying. We're trying to comprehend these old old time old time language. Um, I would encourage you, if that is you, to get yourself. Uh, I wouldn't even start off with a good study Bible. I would start off with a very good Bible that breaks down the language in such a way it's easy for you to understand, but it's true to the text. This is why I use the English Standard Version. Um, even sometimes in the King James Version, Pastor Sam loves the King James Version. Sometimes even the new King James Version might still be too convoluted for some people. Get you a good Bible that will be able to uh, you're able to read the word and is able to be understood. And you have to understand this. It's not just reading comprehension that goes into reading God's word. It's spiritual comprehension. And where you lack in reading comprehension, I want you to know that when you are discerning God's word, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you. I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit will reveal to you his word, the intentions of his word, and what that word is trying to say, not just in a historical perspective, but what that is trying to say to you in your current life. So for this new year, I want to encourage everyone on this Facebook Live, I want you to grow in the word. And when we, he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, you do that by first studying the word. The word is primary. God's word is primary. I remember being a child at New Sardis. I remember being a child at New Sardis, and I remember our pastor constantly um, reminding us, constantly talking about the word. If it, if there were three things for sure when I went to college. When I went to college, there were three things for sure that I knew when I went to college. The first thing was uh, God's word was important. I didn't understand the depth of the importance, but I knew going to college, God's word was important. First, number, first thing, number one, God's word was important. Second thing was evangelism was the call we all had. The word was important. Secondly, evangelism was the call we all had. That was the, those are two things. And the third thing that I knew for sure when I went away to college, and I learned this in the New Sardis Church, the word was important. Evangelism was the call that we all had. And number three was that investing in the kingdom of God was going to bless you throughout your life. Those were the three things I knew. When I went to college, I knew the word, I knew evangelism, and I knew investing in the kingdom of God. I learned that literally sitting under the teaching of our pastor for the last 20, however many years, 24 years I've been at New Stars, because that is what he taught. I didn't understand it fully when I was a kid, and I'm still un unpacking the mysteries of my faith, but I want you to know in this new year, in unpacking the mysteries of who God is and unpacking that in your own life, it starts with the foundation of the word. The word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The word is, is, is stronger than any to edge word. All of that goes back to the word. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That is Jesus the Christ logos. The word, the word, heaven and earth will pass away before God's word passes away. You know, God's word will not return unto him. But all of these scriptures about the word reminds us about the importance of God's word. So in 2022, uh, in, in keeping God first, you have to keep God first, firstly by keeping his word first in your life. So I said all that to say, I read through my Bible every year, and I've grown exponentially since I began to do that. I had a whole degree, Masters of Divinity, from one of the top divinity schools in America. That degree is secondary to the personal devotion that I have in my life and the revelation that God continues to give give me from his word simply by spending time with him in his word. Yale will teach you the uh, the, 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 the um, structure of what church the, the, theology and doctrine is. The word will teach you what that theology and doctrine is supposed to mean in your life in a very practical way. That's why studying the word is important. So, 
Jesus in verse number 20, he said, don't lay up for these treasures things on earth. He says, but lay them up in heaven. You do that by studying the word, keeping God first and studying the word and having a, a literal, uh, um, a systemic way of studying the words. That's keeping God first before you do anything in your life before when the Lord allows you to wake up, you need to be in that word, be in that book. Why? Because the adversary is coming. The adversary is coming, especially when you have made a commitment to Christ, especially when you have made a commitment to doing that which is right. The adversary is going to come. And let me tell you, how he's, he's so conniving. He's so sneaky. And, you know, he does. He knows how to get to us. He knew how to get to Eve. He appealed to her flesh. He appealed to her flesh. He knew how to get to Eve. He when he goes to Jesus, literally in Matthew chapter four, he's appealing to the, to the things that he feels that he thinks that Jesus is going to fall to because Jesus is in flesh. He has no food. He says, let me turn these, these rocks into bread. You know, he wants, if you, if you want fame, he said, well, let me make you powerful. He knows how to appeal to us. He knows how to appeal. So the adversaries come and the only way to fight against the adversary, the only way to be able to do that is having the word, knowing the word and being able to use that word in order to get you out of those situations. The word is able to do that. If you, you notice every time that the adversary came to you, Jesus kept on spitting back, uh, it is written, it is written, it is written. You only get to the it is written in your spiritual life when you have literally read what was written. And in order to keep God first in this new year, we got to be in his word. That means be intentional in Bible study. That means when Bible study is going on, and I find myself doing this as well often, uh, being intentional and sitting down and listening to what the Word is saying. Have your Bible open. If you have commentary, have that stuff open and literally be intentional on doing that. I'm a foster parent. I'm a foster parent. If you don't know that, I'm a foster parent. I'm supposed to actually be on the training right now, but I'm not on the training. In order to do a training, a virtual training in foster in fostering, you have to be in front of your camera. Now, I literally have to be in front of my camera, and I cannot be doing anything else. If it even appears like I'm doing something else, they will kick me out the training, and the training does not count. I need to have that much discipline when it comes to literally being in Bible study. Although Bible study is virtual, I need to be that disciplined and that committed to this Bible study because guess what? This word and this Bible study is going to bless me way more than being anything else in this world way more than those trains in foster care those are very important trends but this word is much more important and if i could be intentional in doing something in the world like that i need to be intentional in doing that in the word of god so when you're in bible study you need to be intentional be in front of the camera having your bible ready having your notes ready i got my notes right here having your bible your notes um and just being intentional on listening to that word and being intentional on taking astute notes so you can go back and you can study that word and you can meditate on that word. One thing, again, I said is one thing to read it. It's another thing to study it. It's another thing to meditate on it. And those are the things we're trying to push you towards in a new year with these old perspectives, right? These over the, and Jesus, if you're going to be in the, if you're going to, have this old perspective for the new year. You got to be in the word. That's the first thing. Second thing you got to do is um, in laying up treasures in heaven and not on earth, you have to be mindful that prayer is our communication with God. Earlier on, he talks about prayer in verses, probably verses five through, I'll say, I'll even go uh, prayer and fasting. They go hand in hand. From, so from verse 5, um, Matthew 6, verse 5, I would say all the way down to verse 18, you get fasting and prayer, they go hand in hand. Those are doing things that, doing spiritual things that makes it intentional on growing in your faith, makes it intentional on being able to become more, go, grow deeper in your relationship with God and being excited about God's word. You know, I get excited when I see people who, I've seen them grow in God's word, and I've seen how God's word has been a transformative thing in their life. There are, 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 are specific people who I, who I think of, 
specifically, and I've seen them growing up. I'm not saying that they're perfect because nobody's perfect, but I'm saying I've seen the spiritual growth in them, and it just makes me excited. One, I, I can talk about she's departed now, Sister, um, Sister Helen Marshall. Sister Helen Marshall, um, I remember Sister Marshall, and I, I, I remember seeing Sister Marshall grow in that world. I remember seeing her. She was already in the world, but seeing her grow in a deeper, more formulated relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You know, I would call and talk to Sister Marshall, and she would talk about that word. She would talk about the word of God, and, you know, it blessed me because I, and she was a senior at that, um, and it blessed me because I saw a senior who did not let age be her case. She did not say, I'm too old. These letters are too tiny. She did not make excuses. She was trying to learn more and more about that work. And that just blessed me as a young person. It blessed me. And it reminds me that even if the Lord lets my golden moments roll on, that I don't have to be old and I don't have to grow old and not and not grow deeper in my relationship with God at 35, although that's the prime of, of our physical lives, the prime of our spiritual lives is continuing to grow. Every year could be a, a better, more energetic, more ex exuberant life in God. That could be the prime of our life. Every year spiritually can be the prime of our life because we're growing in his word. So he says, lay up, for get, lay up not for yourself treasures on earth, but lay them up in heaven. That is how we lay them up in heaven. We lay them up in heaven by doing what he has told us to do. We lay them up, and he's not just talking about um, money. And oftentimes we think this is just talking about money. This is not just talking about money. It's not talking about just investing in the kingdom of God with your finance. It's talking about investing in the kingdom of God with the wholeness of who you are. God cares about the whole. God created a whole human. And this idea that we are right-brained or we are left-brained, there's really an ideology out there around how we interact with the world. It depends on which side of the brain we use. The reality is we use the wholeness. Most people who are, who are adjusted well use the wholeness of their brain. They might use one part more than another part, but we use the wholeness of our brain because the wholeness of our brain is what allows us literally in the physical flesh to breathe and allows us in the physical flesh to walk. We have to use the wholeness of our brain, and we need to use the wholeness of who we are, bring that wholeness and even that whole brokenness to God and use that in order to advance the kingdom of God. But that requires us to keep him first. So that's verse 19, 20, and 21. Um, verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Talking about the light of the body. He says the light of the body is what? The eyes, the eyes, um, it's the light. So this is an entire metaphor. If you don't know, I teach English. I teach uh, figurative language. This is a metaphor. The lamp of the body is the eye personification. Uh, when you give human-like characteristic to non-human things, uh, the lamp of the body is the eye. So the eye is the lamp. If therefore your eye is good, if your eye is good, your eye gate is good. Again, this is a metaphor. It's something deeper going on here. Uh, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Now, what is this light? Lose. It's lose actually in the in the um, in the Latin. What is this light? Uh, I believe it's John chapter one that says, "Light shone in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not." Right? Who is this light? This is really talking about when it says the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. The light is literally Jesus. Jesus is the light. Y'all know we sing that song. It's a great Christmas hymn. We sing for everything except for Christmas. We'll walk in the light, the beautiful life, come with a new job. Yes, Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light. If we have Jesus literally in our eye, Jesus in our eye gate, Jesus who is literally working through us when it's our perspective, when Jesus is the one in which we are in, he says, your whole body is full of light. You don't have a whole body full of light if your body and your life is not rooted in Jesus the Christ. You will not be able to exude light. Therefore, let your light so shine before men so that they might see your good works and glorify him who is in heaven. All of these metaphors of light light. He is the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. All of these metaphors, all of these symbols, all of this, all of this figurative language that talks about light is leading us to Jesus. In order to have this light that literally shines through your life, it requires you 
to have Jesus. It requires you to have him in the entirety of your life. Jesus is saying these words. Jesus is using this personification. He's using this metaphor to get us to understand, to get us to fully understand that in him there is life. There is light and life in him. For he says, for if your eye is bad, if your eye is bad, if your eyes are closed, you cannot see. When you have issues with perception in your eyes, that means part of your eye is messed up. You cannot see fully. He says, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. I.e., if your eye is shut, if your eye is cut off, if your eye is not working, if therefore the light that is in, your, is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So, we have to be in Christ. It is in Christ that our light will shine. It is Christ in us that will allow us to shine. It is Jesus is the light. That's why we sing, Deacon Bat's going to sing this song. He's going to sing uh, uh, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. And it's true. The light that shines within me has to be great. It has to be great. And in order for it to be great, I have to have that light in me. It has to be in me in order for it to shine. So he talks about the light. Then he moves on. And this is talking about finances too. He says, verse 24, I'm on verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or God and money. Let me tell you, and Pastor James says this often, all the time. He said either Jesus will be Lord of all or he won't be Lord at all. And it's true. Uh, God is the creator of all things. God is the creator of all things. He, cre he is the, the creator God. Um, praise God for him being the creator. And imagine the creator creating this creation. And, and this creator knows the true intentions and the true purpose of this creation. And, and this creation... Um, decides upon its own mindset, its own will, um, it, it, its own mind, that it, it does not want to do what its intended purpose is. Um, that's how God, I'm sure, feels about creation. He created us with intent and purpose to, to magnify him, to, to glorify him, to live out meaningful lives that are in him that were in a perfect harmony in a utopia in Eden where all things were, were perfect and all things were great. Um, and then the sinfulness of humanity, man decides on its own recognizance that it's going to go its own way and in going its own way, it, it begins to to damage, that's a good word, it begins to damage the true intention that God had for it as the creation. I, I believe that that is how, uh, a good example of how God sees humanity. I think that's a good example of how God sees humanity. He created us for one thing, we went astray because of our own sinfulness. In our mother's womb where we, cre we were created in sinfulness, um, we are born sinful, born into this sin, shaping in iniquity. Um, so when Jesus talks about no one can serve two masters, when we decide that we're going to go off and not live out what God has told us to live out, live the abundant life that Jesus is going to get to in um, John chapter 8. If, if, we're, if we're not going to do what God has told us to do, live these abundant lives that are in him, through him, and about him, um, we're literally serving other, other gods other gods, small g. We're serving other gods. And if we're going to live this new year out with true expectation and anticipation of the glory of God, we have to be intentional of not having any other gods, any other gods, small g, before the Lord our God, big G. Uh, and that looks like our jobs. That looks like you cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve two masters, but you will either hate one and love the other, you just can't do it. You cannot have multiple multiple people vying for the same position in your life. You just can't do it. 
You can't do it. You, you, you're going to spend more time with one versus spending more time with the other. You're going to be burnt out trying to satisfy this one versus trying to satisfy that one. Um, you're going to, you're going to make yourself go crazy. And the truth, the reality is in our lives, we do this with everything else in our lives and we put God last. We put God, I want to challenge us in 2022, I really do. I want to challenge you to, to, to just live radically on faith. Live radically on faith. Just live radically on faith and believe God. And then believing God, that means you're going to put God first in all things. If it does not, if God is not first in it, in, in what you're doing, then I want you to live by faith and just make the decision, I'm not going to do that. I want you to do that on your job. And doing it on your job, that means you everything you do is intentional on, on a ministry that is supportive by the word of God, a ministry on your job that is going to encourage people, a ministry. And when I say a ministry, I'm not talking about you got to, you leading a Bible study on your job. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you living a life that is pleasing to God and people see that light again, what we just talked about, about that light living in us and that light shining, living that life in such a way that on your job, it's a ministry. On your job, it's you're able to minister to people with the with what God has given you. And maybe you are like me. I'm a teacher, so um, I'm a firm believer also in um, the establishment clause, separation of church and state. But let me tell you something. I'm a believer in separation of church and state. But I will tell you about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about it. I'm not telling you that that's what you have to do uh, as a as a child in my classroom. I tell you that you have to uh, accept Jesus Christ. But I'm gonna tell you who He is to me. Now I'm going to testify about who he is to me. Uh, and I'm unashamed in that. I'm really unashamed in that. Not to everybody I work at Mary Sterling Baptist Church. I'm really unashamed in sharing my faith. My faith. And I'm intentional and I recognize that me sharing my faith, it's about me. It's personal. And in doing that, I see myself as keeping God first. And in doing that, uh, students will come up to you, or my, at least in my school, my students come up to me and ask me about Jesus Christ. And now, you know, I tell them, as, as, far, as far as me and my house goes, you know, I throw scriptures in every, every which way I can. Um, and in doing so, in doing so, looking at the ministry, how I approach teaching, how I approach what I'm doing, I do it with a mindset of, of ministry, as a mindset of serving people, and as a mindset of glorifying God. I want you in everything that you do this year in keeping God primary and everything on your job and keeping God in primary in your marriage and keeping God primary in everything, your finances and everything that you do. I guarantee you, if you do that, it will bless you. He says you cannot, if you start putting things before God, you're going to love one and hate the other. Sometimes that is literal. And when it says hate the other, it means despise. It means you're going to make excuses on why you don't do it, why you're not in the Word, because I got to get sleep. I can't wake up that early. We're not in Sunday school right now, but when we were in Sunday school, I'm not about to wake up that early get to, to get to Sunday school because they ain't talking about nothing. Anymore. But it's God's Word, and maybe maybe the Lord is moving you into a ministry in church school. Maybe that's what he was trying to move you into. But you were so stubborn that you stayed home. I want you to keep God first in everything that you do because in keeping God first, you're not allowing these other small gods to take precedent over the big God, the Lord our God. We make everything idols. We make everything idols. We make our houses idols. People are like, I don't idolize this house. It's just an it's just a, a, a old ragged shack. Yeah, we say that, but then we go to work. We say, I got to get to work because I got to pay this mortgage. While you do have to work to pay your mortgage, that's a fact. You do have to work to pay your mortgage. You better be mindful that God can snatch that job from under you at any time. You better keep God first to keep God your primary and keep that in mind and make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do in order to glorify him and to keep him first in all that you're doing. You know, yes, you do have to go to work. That's a fact. You do have to go to work. It's a fact. You do have to do these things. But what I'm telling you is keep God before. If we do not keep it for the text is clear that we will either we will either hate one of these small guys or we're going to lo and love the other. or We're going to love the other and hate this one. We have to be intentional on keeping God first in this new year. And that's what he talked about when he says uh, you cannot serve both God and man. And talk about resources again, resources versus these sources. So, we talked about finance. Let's talk about something else. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, 
what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. All right, we talked about finances. Two, we're going to talk about fitness. Fitness and fashion. Fitness is number two, fashion is number three. He says, we talked about finance, now fitness and fashion. Um, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more than they? Which of you by word can add one cubit to your sentence? Okay, let's break this down. Therefore, I say to you, this is Jesus talking, do not worry about your life. You know, the death of Betty White came as such a surprise to so many people. Uh, Self-included, because I was... I think I was at the store buying some oxfields when I found out she died. And I was like, oh no, Betty White died. But Betty White was 99 years old. You know, it was a surprise to so many people. Um, and they were making such a hoopla about Betty White's about to be 100. Oh, Betty White's about to be 100. And the irony is that every year, at least at least for the last five years, on December 31st, everybody was like, go check on Betty White, make sure she made it through this year because of the long list of people that died. It's so ironic that she died on December 31st. So everybody's like, oh, Betty White died. Oh, Betty White's gone. Yes, she's gone. Yes, she died. And she, she had a wonderful life. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. But, you know, it says, is life not more than these things? You know, we... We were sad, and we're saddened by her dying. We're saddened by her going home to be with the Lord. But I want you to know, you know, life is temporary. This life that we live is temporary. Uh, I think it's James chapter 4, maybe 13, 14, and 15. And it talks about um, life is a vapor. It appears but for a moment, then vanishes away. And we should say, um, if the Lord will. When we're doing something, we should say, if the Lord's will. will to do. Now, they were making all these plans and preparations to, oh, we're going to have this grand birthday party. And she had just been on the TV about a day or two before. And the Lord called her home just that quick. Um, and, you know, that's just a reminder that we are mortal beings. We are mortal beings. And we only are on this ball of gas called the earth at the will and the whim of God. When God no longer wants us here, he's going to call us home. So why are we spending our time worrying? Because he has already made the promise. We are concerned about fitness. We're concerned about what we're going to wear. We're concerned about how we, what we're going to eat. We're concerned about all these other temporary things. And... We're not concerned about the primary thing, which is God. All this, all this stuff, going, he says, don't worry. Therefore, don't worry about your life. You know, we was worried about Betty White. God called her home. Don't worry about your life. When your life is in him, guess what? Paul said, Paul said the best. He said, I'm, I'm caught between the two. He said, I want to stay, but I want to go. He says, it's better for you that I stay. But he said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Whether you live or whether you die, let me tell you, if you are in him, you good. When you are in him, you're not concerned whether you live or whether you die. Don't, you know, I'm 35 years old. Tomorrow, if I live, I'll be 36. I'm not concerned about anything. (laughs) Let me tell you, I ain't concerned about nothing. Why? This scripture right here really grounds me. I'm not concerned about my fitness. I'm not concerned about my finances. I'm not concerned about my fashion. Why? Because I know that I'm his. And no matter what, I know when I keep him first, he going to take care of me. Stokes going to get taken care of. I ain't worried about that. He going to take care He says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It is it's not life more than food. And body more than raiment, the old text says raiment, and body not more than than clothing. Our lives are more than these temporary things that we put on and these facades that we put in front of us to show the world. Our life is more than that. Listen, I ain't worried about food, and I have been in some spaces where I have been 
broke. When I say broke, broke, broke. Trying to come up with a scheme to come up with some money. You know, I have been in some situations where I've been like that. I Listen, when I really found this scripture and I let this scripture be uh, the guiding for my physical life, I stopped worrying about this stuff. I said, why am I worried about it? Now, I'm his child and he's a good parent. Why am I concerned about the stuff that he, God, is supposed to provide for me, his child? Lord, whatever you give me, I'm satisfied with. I really, I'm content with how God is going to take care of me. Because it might, and listen, this is the thing. It might not be what I want. It might not be that Escalade that I want. And Lord knows I want the Escalade. But Lord, I thank you for providing me with a car. And Lord, if you didn't, if I didn't have a car, thank you for giving me the ability to walk. And Lord, if I didn't have the ability to walk, thank you for allowing me to have resources that I can get a pair of transit. If I could get a pair of transit, Lord, thank you for letting me have a school. Whatever it is that you provided me with, I'm not concerned about my fitness, nor my fashion, nor my finances, because I am putting you first, and I know you're going to provide for me, not just the new year, but throughout the entirety of my life. And keeping in mind this new year, and we have to be mindful that God is going to supply. He's going to provide for you. He said he will supply all your needs according to you, according to his riches and glory. So let me tell you something about his riches and glory. So you put your money in a bank, in a bank, $250,000 was backed up. You guarantee if you got any money in that bank, $250,000, you guarantee to get that money back out that bank. No matter what, it is federally insured. Is federally insured, and that's the amount of money it's federally insured up to. Let me tell you, the backing of God's promise is much more than the backing of the FDIC. If God has made you the promise that he will supply according to his riches and glory, he has He has bolts that have not even been looked at. He has, has things stockpiled. How do you know? So, Because it says that eyes have not seen, neither ears heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. Those things that the Lord has, has, provi- has, has in store for those. Listen, he has it. It is already, he has the provision. And if we keep him first, and the beauty of grace and mercy is, even when we don't keep him first, he still provides for us. That's the beauty of grace and mercy. That even when we don't put him first, thank you, God, that he still provides for us. And you might be like, what kind of provisions is he making? Did you have water today? Just think about that. Did you have water today? Even if your water cut off, did you have an opportunity to acquire water today? Everybody could have said yes to that because there's somewhere for you to get some water, somewhere public to get some water. There is plenty places for God to make provisions for us. So in this new year, we're not fo- we're not going to be focused on finance. We're not going to be focused on fitness. We're not going to be focused on fast. We're going to be focused on God. And if I keep God first, he's going to make sure my finances together. If I keep God first, he's going to make sure my fitness together. If I keep God first, he's going to make sure my fashion together. He's going to make sure I am together. Why? Because he said no good thing would he withhold from those who would walk upright. And that is a word, that is a promise in his word. You see, in order to have access to that promise in his word, you got to be in his word. You have to be in his word. It's, it's, it's one thing to have the key to the lock. It's one thing to have the key to the lock and knowing that what's behind the locked door is treasures and treasures untold. It's one thing to have the key. It's another thing to use the key. So many of us, we all have the key. The key is right here in his word. To be able to use that key to unlock the the, the lock of faith, to be able to have access to this abundant life that flows in and through him requires us to use the key, requires us to be in this word. This word is what's going to make our finances come be all right. This word is going to make our fitness be all right. This word is going to make our fashion be all right. This word, it requires us to be in this word, in this word. So he said, don't worry about your fitness. He said, don't worry about your finance. Don't worry about your fashion. 
He says, which of you by worrying, listen, you worrying? It says it right here, right here in this text. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? Which of, which of you on this Facebook worry and you were able to grow? You were able to physically grow. That's what he says. Which of you by worry can, can, can physically grow? Because of your work. No, no, no. Let me tell y'all something. Let me tell y'all something. Worrying is an antithesis to your faith. Faith requires you to believe. This is why Jesus said you have to have faith like a child. Because children have blind faith. Children just believe their parents. Children just follow. Uh, children are, 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 we can say they're gullible. But children have blind faith. They just believe. We need to have faith like children and just believe. And we're worrying we're worrying about the, the foolishness of this world. Stop worrying about it. You worrying about it, let me tell you, you worrying about it is not going to change nothing. But I tell you what, if you, just, if you just tap into God and be like, you know, God, you got, you got it all. You got, you, got my, you got my fitness in your hands. You got my, my fashion in your hands. You got my finance in your hands. You have all these things in your hands. What am I worrying about? I ain't going to worry, God. I'm not going to worry because I know you're going to take care of me. <laughs> you're going to take care of me. I'm your child. Oh, I'm your child. He says that later on in this verse. So why do you worry about clothes? And consider, listen, this is the part that really gets me. He says, consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin. This is, they neither grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, that even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Hear me, 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 hear me. I said this um, in my school. Um, I have a teacher at my school who does a lot of horticulture and she does a lot of um, planting um, things in her yard. And I plant some stuff, but let me tell you, I, I can plant it, but Lord, no, I, it is the upkeep of the planting that really gets me. I just, I said, I just don't have time to do the upkeep. I enjoy planting it and it looks good for about the first three weeks. Then I fall off. But she's like, no, you got to keep it up. You got to keep it. I said, and it made me think of the scripture. I said, you know, when these flowers grow in the wild, don't nobody go water them flowers. Don't nobody go look after the flowers. They just grow. And they look so beautiful. They just grow and they look so beautiful. I said, you know, that's something. God takes care of those flowers. It made me think of the scripture. I said, you know, and I was sitting in the planning center. I was sitting in the planning center at my school. And I just got excited. I said, you know, God takes care of those flowers. And I said, don't you know I'm more than that flower? I said, don't you know God going to take care of me? Because he said that. He said, I am more important than the flowers. He said, the grass that's here today and is consumed by the, by the fire this evening. He says, the birds. He said, ain't you more than them? And I know that I'm more than them. And that makes me happy because I know he going to take care of me because I'm his child. And that is the beauty of it all. That he going to take care of me. And that's why I love with with Surgeon C that song as e e Ephesian Prince Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee would sing it. Uh, uh, and Pookie would get up there and she would say, Jesus promised he'll take care of me. And it is so true. He made that promise. And that's another promise right here in this word. But you will never tap into that promise if you do not know his word. He promised to take care of me. And he says it right here. You all need to have an understanding of what Solomon literally means. Again, I told you in the very beginning, the book of Matthew is telling you that Jesus was a Jewish savior come to save the Jewish people. That's Matthew's entire perspective. That's why Matthew was always talking back, going back to the law. That's why Matthew starts it off connecting Jesus to the patriarch of the faith because he wants you to know that Jesus was a Jewish man. That's why he's using Solomon right here because Solomon Solomon is important to the narrative of Judaism. When you talk about the first, first temple Israel, Solomon is the one whom God chooses to build this temple. When you talk about, it says in the scripture, um, it's in Chronicles and it's in Kings. It says that silver was so abundant 
in Solomon's um, um, kingdom, it said it meant enough. That's how abundant silver was in Solomon's kingdom. Solomon, when he, when Jesus said, look at all of these things and how beautiful they are, he likens it unto Solomon. He says, Solomon, the great king, the one whom, whom succeeds David, the great king with great wisdom who built the great temple, have, a, have an understanding of the three T's that the Jewish people are looking, looking after. They look for tradition, they look for the Talmud, which is the law, and they look for the temple. So he says, Solomon, who represents one of these great T's, he says, look at what God provides for these things that are here today and consumed tomorrow. He said, and Solomon don't even look like them. That's how great God is to us. That is how much God takes care of. And I want you to know in 2022, if you keep him first, your finance, your fitness, your fashion, they will all be taken care of. He says Solomon don't even look like these lilies in these fields because God has been taken care of. I tell you, a person who's been taken care of by God looks mighty good. A person that's been taken care of by God, although they've been through some hell, they still look marvelous because they have been taken care of by somebody who can keep them. Who? Therefore, do not worry, saying, you sh what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles sing, Gentiles, those who, again, be mindful, Matthew, Jewish people, Jews, Gentiles, Gentiles were evil. He says, the Gentiles, the Gentiles seek for these things. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, all these things. Don't you know that God knows what you need before you even know, before you even ask him? God knows what you need. But this is the part right here. This is the whole kit and the caboodle. All summed up in verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And guess what? All these things, your finance, your fitness, your fashion, will be added unto you. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things, that's the entirety of your life, he's going to add them unto you. That is the reason why we're keeping God First. We're keeping him first because he has promised to add unto us these other worldly things that we like. All these things always nice to have some more toys to play with. That's always not. But we're doing it so we can grow deeper in him. The primary reason for us on earth at this point is to, to seek out justice, to, to, to work towards justice. And to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of justice. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel that is here to help the least, the lonely, the, the lost, and the left out. That is a gospel of justice. We are in this world solely to tell others about the liberating love of our liberating Lord. That's how this verse ends. Then he says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about its own thing, sufficient for the day. Is this all trouble? We're not going to worry this year. This is not our year of worry. This is our year of worship, not our year of worry. And we're starting to get off intentional. No matter what comes your way, be intentional on keeping God first. Before you write any of your bills out, make sure you pay your tithes. Before your feet hit the floor, make sure you are giving that time, intentional beginnings of your day to God. Before you do anything on your job, make sure that you are making God your primary reason. Everything that you do, I tell you, if you make God the primary and not the secondary, and many of you all might have insurance, you understand primary insurance, secondary insurance. If you don't, keep on living and get uh, Medicare Part A, Part B. Trust me, I deal with my grandmama. So you primary, secondary, make him your primary. Primary always pays more. Make it your pri Make him your primary. It'll bless you beyond your measure. I tell you it will. But you got to make him your primary. All right, y'all, we've been on here for a whole hour. I'm sorry that I talked to y'all for a whole hour, but I hope that this is some food for your fire. I hope this is some light for your fire, some oil for your lamp. I hope that it is all those things. As we go forth into 
going forth into this new year. As we go forth, we go forth with anticipation and expectation of the greatness of God of the goodness of God, of the grace of God. We go forth with seeking those G's and seeking God. We're going to keep them first so that our finance and our fitness and our fashion will be all right. And we only get that because of our faith. Faith is the, the thing that ties them all together. Finance, fitness, and fashion will only be taken care of when we firstly have faith and faith in him. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony of your word this evening, O Lord, O Lord. And may we keep you as our primary, O God. Keep you first in all that we do. Seeking you first, Father, in all that we do, Father. Seeking your guidance, seeking your voice, seeking your advice, O Lord. Father, in seeking you first, O God, we're standing firmly upon the promises that you have made to us, O God. That if we seek you first, Father, that all these things will be added unto us, O God. So we thank you right now. We go forth into this, into this world, O Lord, Father, into our home, Father. Back to the conversation that we were having before, O God. We go forth, Father, with the hope and joy, Father, with you as the light of our life, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you all. Uh, see y'all tomorrow. Well, they'll see y'all tomorrow for morning with morning moments with the master at nine o'clock a.m. sharp. All right, God bless you all, and see you later. Bye bye.